The Pacific Great Blue Heron, a wading bird. At 2.5 kilograms, 1 meter height, and 2 meter wingspan, the third largest heron in the world. Its life is intricately tied to ecosystems of the Fraser River Delta and Georgia Strait in British Columbia, and in one special place coexists with humans. Peacefully? Well, we shall see. The place is Vancouver, British Columbia, in 400 hectare Stanley Park. The coastal temperate climate and beautiful seasons attracts 1 in 15 Canadians. Vancouver is a large bustling harbour city flanked by mountains and water. I filmed this documentary of the Stanley Park Heron Colony to promote conservation of this spectacular bird. I'll show you the remarkable breeding season and the heron's tumultuous relationship with a predator, the bald eagle. The great blue heron is a conservation concern because its habitat coincides with ours. 80% of its population and 80% of British Columbians live on the coast. Herons prefer to breed within 10 kilometers of rich fishing grounds such as these, Coal Harbor, Spanish Banks, and English Bay. Its prehistoric appearance includes downward-facing eyes, evolved to hunt fish. Winter in Vancouver. Polar bear swim time. Nests are full of snow and no space eaters. Herons are often found in outlying fields. These are juvenile bald eagles hunting for mice and voles, shrews, small mammals, similar prey of this great blue heron with its winter plumage. The heron resorts to small mammals in winter due to the shortage of fish. In February at this Ladner Slough, wading herons are developing breeding plumage. As snow geese get ready to migrate from Ladner to Wrangell Island in Russia to breed, spring is prompting some herons to return to Vancouver. Isn't it romantic? Music in the night, a dream that can be heard. Isn't it romantic? Morning shadows write the oldest magic world. I hear the breezes playing in the trees. Males arrive before females gathering on local rooftops in the West End near English Bay. In 1921, the colony was located at Brockton Point relocated in the 70s to the now-closed zoo and apparently got fish handouts from the penguin keeper. The males fly in to claim existing nests. Herons relocated here between the park board office and the tennis courts in 2001. These empty nests are maple trees and we monitor the colony all season from the roof of this building. The eagles also have nests in Stanley Park. Gathering for courtship displays occurs when tides are high. At low tides, females forage to fatten up for egg production. A stretch display. A circle flight display. The heron laboriously flaps and glides with its neck outstretched. Ending with an impressive landing display. I just give that a 9.8.
The black and white crown highlights the flushed orange beak. Head feathers are pronounced. Herons grow lanceolate plumes along the neck, chest, and back, and filamentous plumes on the chest that look hairy. These traits signal the quality of a mate. Herons are seasonally monogamous, and like most monogamous birds, males and females indistinguishable by plumage, like crows and Canada geese. So how do they recognize their own mate? Fluffing feathers is part of the breeding ceremony. A bald eagle in a nearby sequoia. The eagle, or some other disturbance, may cause the herons to abandon their nests. Ross Benesland, a heron expert and Parks Canada biologist, why they take off like that. We see them being very sensitive early in the season and generally that's thought to be related to the amount of investment they have in the current brood. So early in the season, uh, before they lay eggs, of course, there's little investment in the, the breeding opportunity, probably just you know developing a relationship with your mate. Um, and once they lay eggs, then they have more investment and they generally tend to be less sensitive. That makes sense if you look at the physiology of herons. They're quite a large bird and their egg is quite small uh, relative to their body size. So laying eggs is probably not a big energetic uh, expenditure for them. Sometimes you don't even see what causes them to flush. So in that case, it could just be one bird goes and they all just say, okay, I don't know, I don't see what's coming, but better go anyway. Heron rush hour is over. Males chase antagonists away from a two-meter territory around their nest. Tensions can run high, but with no dire consequences. Beak dueling is not aggression, but a kind of heron flirting one way in which pairs bond with one another. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it, let's do it, let's fall in love. Ba -da, ba -da, ba. Oh, birds, as descendants of land-dwelling reptiles, require internal fertilization. As with most birds, one exception is the mallard, male herons have no penis but a cloaca, a urogenital opening. So male and female cloacas have to somehow make contact to transfer sperm. Egg formation is correlated with high sea temperatures, warm beaches, heralding the arrival of lots of fish. Therefore, copulation timing is morning and evening, so females can forage at daytime low tides. Cuckoldry is rare in herons, perhaps because there is little privacy.
The activity results in 75 gram asynchronously laid eggs over a few weeks. The first eggs are incubated immediately, resulting in asynchronous hatching. The advantage of asynchronous hatching, exhibited by many species, has various hypotheses, which I'm not going to tell you. There is one way to distinguish males and females at a distance. Generally, the male fetches twigs and the female weaves the nest, which must eventually hold up to four large chicks fighting for food. Nest materials include twigs gathered at local trees as well as from unguarded or abandoned nests. This twig was apparently not good enough for the female. The male is looking a little despondent, but he'll go and have another try for a better twig. This subspecies of great blue heron, Ardea herodias fanini, doesn't migrate, and its isolation has led to darker plumage than that of other subspecies. The first branch brought back to a potential nest site. Why choose this spot, or any spot in particular? Whoops! Upside down is probably not the best position to get twigs. Nests are built from scratch, or old ones are refurbished. Males bring twigs one at a time. Here you can see the location under the chest feathers of the brood patch. Additional twigs will be brought when the eggs are laid, and again when they hatch, presumably to keep the eggs and chicks warm and prevent them from falling from the nest. And they will get twigs from the ground under the colony, many fallen from nests above. But fresh branches are pulled off trees are best. Not as easy as it looks. How does this ungainly wading bird with skinny legs manage in trees? Their flexible necks and flapping counterbalance rocking motions. The scaly legs reveal their reptilian ancestry. Their long toes grip branches. Compare the heron's toenails with the eagle's sharp talons. So armed with long toes, this unlikely candidate builds nests in trees. This colony began with four, peaked at 180, and now sports around 100 nests. Eagle nest can be over two meters wide and weigh 1,000 kilograms. A heron's nest is smaller, about one meter in diameter and three to six kilograms, but crazy strong. In a windstorm that blew down 10,000 trees in the park, only four heron nests fell and no trees. In a local cafe, I talked with Rob Butler, author of the book The Great Blue Heron, and asked how long it takes to build a nest. Well, if they build a nest in the springtime, they've got quite a bit of time before they're going to lay eggs and things, so it will be dragged out. It could be you know, quite a long period of time, it could be several weeks. But if they lose the nest, if it falls down, they can quickly reassemble it in about a week. And that's just about the time that it takes for the female to get back into condition and be ready and fertile. For her to produce the egg, she needs, I think, about five or six days to get an egg fertile and be ready to uh, fertilize it. So they got to get that nest done quickly. And they'll go to, go to town on that and build it very quickly. So it doesn't take long at all.
This would be hard to do with two opposable thumbs. Okay, pop quiz. Is this a male or a female heron? He's carrying the twig, it's the male. So nest building behavior is one way to tell the males and females apart, but there are other morphological differences. The main sexual dimorphism is size, the male being larger. His beak or colman is 17 centimeters, the female's 14 centimeters. Eagles are opposite, the females are larger. Preening takes a significant amount of the heron's time. Feathers have hooks holding the barbs together that are reattached when preening. Feathers are important not only for flying, but for insulation and advertising. It's important to keep them flexible, strong, waterproofed, and free of parasites. Well, they have all these uh, uh, feather down. It's a special down that they have uh, underneath the, the body feathers that they use to um, cover the, the plumage, probably to get rid of slime from, from fish and so on. And so they use the bill to chip away at this, and it's like a powder down. It's like a, a like a talcum powder. And if you ever get a hold of one in your hands, you can feel it. It's kind of this talcum-y kind of feel to it. And to spread that around, they have a toe with a special nail with a little comb on it. You look at it up close, you can see the sort of ridges on it. And that's used to spread this powder down around through the feathers. They get fish slime on their feathers during fishing trips at low tide. They skillfully catch perch, flounder, sticklebacks, gunnels, sculpins, and crabs. Fish like intertidal waters where it's warm and there is some shelter. Herons conserve energy by flying in a straight line to and from feeding spots, but sometimes they show more aerial agility. I asked Rob Butler about the heron's evolutionary adaptations for fishing. They have the bifocal vision, so you'll see the eyes come forward, and so they, that gives them the depth perception, and you'll see they line up the bill with that and that they can see where it is and then they get very close and you see uh, they lower the head on the water and I think that has something to do with the refraction being able to see. You see young ones will spear and they miss. The adults rarely miss. They, and so they, they zero in with the head and then they move the body underneath the head so the head stays still and the body creeps in behind and that just winds up the neck into that S shape and then they just release. It, it is really interesting to watch them because I, I, you know, watch thousands of them feeding, and I've gone down there onto those eelgrass beds, the same place, and I've got down low just like a heron. I look, and I can't see a fish. I can't see them. You know, I, I stare and I think, what do they see? How do they do this? You know, they're amazing. Here at Spanish Banks, the sandbar goes way out, and there's lots of eelgrass and fish. Plus, it's a short flight to the Stanley Park Colony. Lost Lagoon is close too. It used to be a tidal flat harvested by indigenous peoples, and now sports carp, stickleback, sculpins, and beavers.
Ed's bill has finely serrated edges that provide a good hold, and they toss fish back into their mouth. They will eat a duckling if they can catch it. need to eat enough to sustain themselves and lay eggs. The 28-day incubation is generally a quiet time, but only on the part of the herons. There is much human activity and noise around the colony, to which the herons seem to be habituated. Novel disturbances and new prolonged disturbances, however, could cause flushing of the colony and even abandonment. Although the herons are quiet during incubation, when visited by one of these, the collective volume of herons and crows goes up. years, eagles have been popping into the local heron farmer's market for eggs. This behavior was first observed at Beacon Hill Park in Victoria, where the eagle got the name Birdzilla. Can herons protect their eggs from eagle predation? to chase away the larger four to seven kilogram eagle with the crazy powerful talons. Steam comes from the warm recently devoured eggs. My observation is that heron and eagle never get quite close enough for contact. They are both naturally concerned, the heron of the eagle's talons and the eagle of the heron's 17 centimeter beak. All nests in the colony are named. The eagle is in nest B2 with the curved branch, and we will see how life in this nest unfolds. Some herons just stay out of the way until the coast is clear. Eagles are carnivores and have a generalist kind of diet, including eggs, fish, and mammals. And they will scavenge and steal food from other birds, such as osprey. This made Benjamin Franklin incensed that the bald eagle became the U.S. national emblem. He writes, He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living, honestly. There are four or five eagle nests in Stanley Park and one across the water. Our hypothesis is that herons will set up shop close to an eagle nest. The premise is that one eagle will take some of the brood, but ward off other eagles from its territory. Around here, most of the eagles diet as birds, including gulls, pigeons, and chicks of assorted species. But 
remember, gulls, crows, and herons, for that matter, also eat birds, especially chicks. Some herons are more aggressive than others and can perhaps chase the eagle away. An eagle dropped into our nest, B2, eight times. But the female heron continued to lay eggs. Relative to its body size, eggs are small and fairly cheap to produce. Will any chicks hatch and survive? Well, we shall see. The herons did get more aggressive as incidents of predation increased. goes on and female herons keep producing eggs in two to three day intervals. Parents take turns incubating for about 27 days. They incubate as soon as the first egg is laid so they hatch asynchronously. Characteristic settling movements bring the brood patch, a soft bald spot, in contact with eggs. The patch becomes infused with blood vessels and sensitive to temperature. The adult stands up to rearrange itself and rolls eggs every couple of hours. This distributes heat evenly and prevents the egg membrane from sticking to the shell. A hole in the egg where a chick gets its first gulp of air. A newly hatched chick is near naked with a bit of down. Maybe two days old. Their little heads appear flat. After hatching, adults lay on the chicks for about three weeks until they can regulate their own temperature because birds are endotherms, or warm-blooded like mammals, unlike fish, amphibians, and reptiles. This little guy is backing out of the egg. Parental care falls to both parents. Both feed their offspring, but at first, one adult stays behind to protect chicks from predators. The chick grabs the adult's beak to encourage regurgitation. When chicks are small, food is released to the bottom of the nest and they scramble for it. Born at 50 to 75 grams, they grow at an alarming rate, about 40 grams per day, and get to be a whopping two and a half kilograms, or five and a half pounds, in eight weeks. That would be like you and I reaching adult size by four years old. The following year, I filmed the same nest and noticed both parents would stick around longer than usual, probably because of the high incidence of even predation on the eggs that you saw earlier. Only one chick remains in this nest.
most rapid growth is between 10 and 40 days of age. So for four weeks, young herons require an enormous amount of food for this crazy growth spurt. Each chick consumes about 500 kilocalories, that's calories with a capital C, per day. The parent needs about the same for itself. At the peak period of chick growth, a pair of herons can take in nearly 2,400 kilocalories of energy each day, equivalent to the diet of a typical North American. The larger chicks grab the beak so they are the ones to get the food directly into their own gullet. Aggression between siblings starts early and doesn't necessarily stop with satiation. Chicks fight directly out of the egg and continue for their entire lives. It's competition for food. Since they hatch asynchronously, one chick is bigger than the rest and can establish dominance. Often, younger siblings are picked until they die or are pushed out of the nest. This one has its sibling's head in its mouth, probably mistaking it for food. They are not cannibalistic as far as I know. Up this London plane tree, they're squabbling at the top. Underneath the tree, you have to be careful. The sign is for cars not to park here because, well, you know. Toward the end of the season, the nests are white. Not the color you want your car or your head to be. One hypothesis of aggression is resource partitioning among chicks, but it's probably just competition. Sometimes all that fighting results in a chick falling from the nest. I asked Robin Worcester, professional biologist in wildlife conservation and ecology, what happens to the chicks? Every spring we see herons falling out of the nest and sometimes they don't survive um, and sometimes uh, they do survive. So uh, in nature they would just hop around on the ground and if they can avoid predators they would eventually learn to fly from the ground. Um, but in this urban environment it's just a bit too dangerous and so they're often uh, picked up and transported to wildlife rescue associations who can raise them up. Raccoons eat fallen chicks. The raccoons used to get chicks in nests, taking as much as 50% of the brood. But the Stanley Park Ecology Society put flashing around the trees to prevent raccoons climbing. Coyotes will scavenge for fallen chicks. This coyote is recognizable by its thin tail, which earned him the name Rope. Rope is resting to later hunt its real prey. Can you guess who a nocturnal predator may be? The Barred Owl. And a bald eagle pair, back for seconds. Mates for life, their mating season started in late winter, and now they need to feed their offspring as well as themselves.
The bald eagle is one of Canada's largest birds of prey and the only eagle exclusive to North America. Its wingspan is over two meters. And he's gonna land in here. Whoa, nice, nice. An eagle's carrying capacity may be about two kilograms, so it has a hard time lifting a large chick from a standing position in the nest. Importantly, the chick must be subdued or dead before lifting off. In fact, this eagle eats a large portion of the chick in the nest, perhaps to lighten the load before taking off with it in its talons. Remember, eagles are carnivores on top of the food chain. Birds eating birds is just part of the chain, and eagles have their own chicks to bring up. Bald eagles are becoming more frequent predators in the heron's world because eagle population numbers have increased considerably since the 1980s. They made a remarkable recovery from near extinction from being hunted, trapped, and poisoned. Each year, on almost the same date, eagles lay two to three eggs, and after a 35-day incubation, chicks hatch. These chicks are about 10 weeks old, destined to fledge in a couple of weeks. They are waiting for food. This nest is in the Southlands area of Vancouver and close to the Fraser River, so the main food brought back to the nest is fish, not herons. The parent tears the fish with its beak into bite-sized manageable chunks for the chicks. As large as the chicks are, they are completely dependent on mom and dad. Both male and female eagles feed their young. I'm betting this one is the female, as they are larger, four to seven kilograms, as opposed to the two or four kilogram size of the males. Southlands is a very posh area of Vancouver. I was able to film this nest because they are wide open spaces for horses and horseback riding. While filming, I saw a very famous person, but I can't tell you who it was. An eagle at Jericho. Do you recognize these prey items we found under the nest? Eagle presence at the colony makes young herons nervous. They look like meerkats. This adult spreads wings over rather large chicks to hide them. This one is protecting a younger brood. Younger chicks are around later in the season because herons lay another clutch of eggs if their first clutch is lost or whole brood of chicks is lost. Trouble is warded off for now and the eagle causes a heron uproar in each tree she flies over or into. 
I raced up to the roof one morning, and this eagle had already devoured at least one chick by the time I got there. sure this is the female. Judging by the hair and noise level in the colony, I'd say the male was in a different tree. Eagles often hunt together as a pair, and this season both came to the colony often together. This eagle took its quarry to a nearby nest in Stanley Park to feed this young eaglet. It's just poking his head out with its two large beak. The young ones. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for showing us. This is the nest, if you remember, that had eggs taken eight times. Since then, the adults have spent more time than normal with the chicks, who also became aggressive toward the eagle. Will it be enough? One chick disappeared from the nest, but I did not see if it was an eagle or it fell accidentally, which does happen frequently and the chicks are often rescued by the park board. The adult and remaining chicks are showing a lot of aggression. An eagle is perusing the colony from a height. It looks like the crows chase the eagle away, but to be perfectly honest, I think the eagle does what it wants. And left alone, the chicks are more vulnerable. Sometimes an eagle would wait for hours in a local tree harassed by crows and gulls. Eagles are raptors, birds of prey, and usually catch and subdue prey with strong talons covered with small spikes called spicules. This chick, however, survived. We found it on the ground. Kept it in our sights for three hours or so until the park board came to the rescue. It had a clear injury on the side of its neck, probably from the eagle's talons. It 
its wing flapping shows that it is still in good shape and the park board can relocate it to the lagoon in Stanley Park where it can fish for itself. It is pretty much ready to fledge or leave the nest anyway. And this one was a second chip fallen out of a nest that same morning. This park board employee is an amazing person. She skillfully caught both fallen herons and transported them to the lagoon to join lots of other fledglings just learning to fish and survive on their own. In the very early hour, about 4 o'clock, of another morning, the last chick in our nest is standing away on a branch. valiantly trying to fend off the eagle. I didn't see what happened on the ground, but this time the eagle prevailed. Its predation method is to subdue prey with talons and clip the spine with its beak. The preferred prey of eagles is fish, but if fish are scarce, eagles feast on rabbits, squirrels, birds, and even young deer. These young eaglets will mature in three to six years if they survive. Like herons, 50% of eagles don't survive their first year. Bald eagles are a large bird, but for their size, quite light. Like all birds, they have a hollow skeleton, weighing perhaps 0.2 kilograms or half a pound. Its 7,000 feathers weigh about 600 grams or just over a pound. 30 feathers would weigh less than a penny. Do you remember pennies? Interestingly, when a bald eagle loses a feather in one wing, it will lose a feather in the other to keep its balance. And the word bald, incidentally, comes from piebald, meaning patchy. Life goes on at Stanley Park. Lost Lagoon Geese Families. A hungry Douglas Squirrel. And a beaver showering at a seawall pipe after an ocean dip. The great blue heron, Ardea herodias finini, is arriving at the end of the breeding season. Many chicks survive to reach nine weeks of age and have their big hair day. At nine weeks, these chicks can distinguish their own parent returning to the nest from a distance. I asked Rob Butler about the chicks' behavior. Yeah, what they're trying to do is um, trying to get the food as it comes out of the out of the mouth of the, the parent and. Um, their siblings are trying to do the same thing and they're, what they're trying to do is dominate it. They want to be the, the one. So they're grabbing the bill hoping that they'll, they'll, the adult will open, the, open up and open the floodgates and out will come the food and they will get it.
you'll see that when they get older, you know, the, the parents really get quite beaten up by the kids there on the nest. And they, they come in and they just feel like, okay, here's the food, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> they drop it on the nest and hop off the nest. That's it. <laughs> This chick is pretending to be part of a different family. Two months of feeding demanding chicks definitely does wear the parents out. You can see a third eyelid or nicotating membrane on this resting heron. We have the remnants of one ourselves. This is the nest that lost three chicks this season, but in the same nest last year, footage shows four surviving chicks. Nest J this year had three chicks survive the season. A stance to cool down. And panting works too. You can identify a young heron by remnants of down, a slate gray crown, lack of long body plumes, and chestnut colored edging to wing coverts. Those are small feathers covering the flight feathers. They flap to strengthen wings for flight. When they leave the nest for the first few weeks are called fledglings. For the rest of the first year, juveniles, between 12 and 24 months, yearlings, after which they mature and become adult parents, parents themselves, often going back to their birth colony. The empty nests and trees are splattered with white guano. And the smell is very interesting. It's time to take the first flight from home. So this was the story of Herons in Stanley Park in Vancouver, BC. Because of its location, the most frequently visited heron colony in BC, the young herons making their first flights are habituated to lots of noise disturbance, like marathons in the park. The young herons are exploring their independence. In spite of noise and human activity, like the Vancouver Sun Run of 40,000 or so people, goes right by the colony. A lot of plane traffic, and people playing tennis directly below. The colony seems to be doing quite well after 17 years. Hustle and bustle of city life, it's nice to know that the heron can find some peace while fishing in its intertidal habitat. I asked Rob Butler, why conserve this heron colony? These big colonies are, are putting out young on a regular basis. In fact, all the colonies around the Fraser uh, are probably the source of recruits that keep the areas over on Vancouver Island, Sunshine Coast, it's going. The young from here go out there and they don't do as well. They don't seem to be nesting as, as successfully. These big colonies seem to be the place, you know, the, the source. So if we look at all the colonies, there's a few that are really 
regularly putting out all these young ones. So but it, it puts a different value on them. The other thing to consider here is that the, the herons have to have a place to nest and a place to feed. And if you look at the places where they feed, there's things like the Fraser Delta and there's some of these eelgrass beds. And all of the colonies are within about uh, 10 kilometers of those feeding areas, maybe a little bit more, but not much. And the reason for that is that if it gets too far, they spend too much time in transit going back and forth when the tide is low and they can't get enough food back to the young. So they can't just nest everywhere. You've got, if, if you look at those main feeding areas and draw a circle, say 10 kilometers around it, you realize there aren't a lot of these places on the coast that are you know, consistently good. And so you've got to protect both the feeding place and you've got to have enough places for them to build those nests within 10 kilometers. And you know, we've only got a few of them that are for the big colonies.